Welcome back, AP Calc BC students. Mr. Record here for our finale to topic 1013, finding intervals of convergence of functions. This time, we're going to do something kind of cool. We're going to do something that's going to start to segue into the final part of BC calculus. We're going to look at a function, a function's derivative, and the integral or antiderivative of a function and sort of compare each of their intervals of convergence. So let's take a look at this. Now, all of our founding fathers of calculus, that would be Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz and Leonard Euler and the Lagrange and all the Bernoulli family used power series very extensively. They thought that it was a great way to develop upon these really fundamental ideas of, of calculus and, and series. And because of this, you can start to think, well, do you think it ever occurred to any of them that can, can we take a look at a power series and determine if it's convergent? Uh, I'm sorry, if it's continuous? Uh, maybe we could find the limit of a series. Well, for that matter, why don't we look at the derivative of a power series or maybe the antiderivative? And so all of those ideas started to percolate and it really opened the door for us to be able to do things with functions that we could never do before. But now we can if those functions are written as a power series. So that's kind of where this is all going to be heading. But I want to go ahead and first of all introduce a theorem. It looks like a pretty long theorem. But basically this theorem is going to talk about what the relationship is between intervals of convergence of a function as well as that function's derivative and integral. So if we have a function f of x given by your typical power series formula here, written out here in the open form, we will know that this has a radius of convergence of some capital R. Let's say that that is the case. Well, that means that that interval would be c minus r, c plus r. And I know we don't quite maybe know exactly what's happening at the endpoints, let's say, but that's really not the issue at this point. We just know that it has this interval from c minus r to c plus r. And let's say that we know that that function is, is uh, differentiable and therefore obviously continuous, so we can do some calculus stuff with it. So what kind of calculus stuff can we do? Well, how about we take the derivative of a series? Yep, I said it. You can take the derivative of a series. And it's really exactly what you would expect. You're going to take this exponent in, pop it out in front, because we are taking this derivative with respect to x. a sub n is a constant. The x minus c is now raised to one less power. And then technically, you would need to multiply by the derivative of x minus c, but that's just one anyway. So the the chain rule doesn't really produce anything special. And if you were to run your ends in for this and equate it, you would end up with something that does indeed agree with the derivative of this double starred expression if you were to do the derivative term by term. Now there is one little catch. It's something I don't want you to work up yourself over here, but you may have to change the uh, starting boundary in order to produce that effect. Um, it's not something that really is a big deal because I, I suppose if one started with n equals 0, it's very likely that your first term is going to be 0 anyway. But I just wanted to alert you to the fact that oftentimes, for convenience, we might change that opening uh, value of n. That's not so much the important part of this lesson. That might come up into uh, a couple of uh, problems in some future topics. I want to make sure that we also know how to integrate a power series. So what is going to happen here is that you're going to this time take your n and raise it up one, as we can see here, and then be sure to divide by that same exponent. And the a sub n is just going to be a constant out in front. Now, like all integrations or 
indefinite integrals, we need to add a plus c. Notice that that plus c is written prior to the summation, because if you write it after, it's a little confusing about whether or not that's going to be part of the summation or not. It kind of forces you to have to put parentheses to show that it is not. But to fix all that, just put the c in front, and everybody's life is a whole lot easier. And then again, you can run your n equals 0. Here we're going to stick with 0. And if you uh, do this term by term, you would end up with an expression that is indeed the same thing that you would get if you integrated this particular piece with respect to x a term by term. So what we have to do now is determine, well, what, what about the radius of convergence? What is there any kind of relationship? Well, the radius of convergence of the series obtained by differentiating or integrating a power series is the same, is the same as that of the original power series. So I suppose if you found the interval of convergence for f, you don't have to go through the the whole ratio test, right, to find f prime or f integral uh, interval of convergence. But, but, oh, there's always a catch, isn't there? The thing that you're going to have to remember, these intervals may differ at the endpoints, so you're at least going to have to check the endpoints. So that's something that's worth discussing. So we got two things working here, differentiating and integrating power series, and then this idea of the intervals of convergence being the same, except for possibly at the endpoints. Now, what I want to do is before we dive headfirst into example four, I've got a really fun, I call it fun, activity that I would say that if you're watching this, the best thing that you could possibly do is to uh, read this through with me and then pause the video and see if you can find these three answers on your own and then resume the video and see how close you were. So the activity is given this particular uh, power series. This is a, uh, an infinite uh, series with x to an n power. Thus, it makes it a power series. Write out the expression that includes the first five terms of the series. Your second job is to find the derivative by differentiating each term one by one in that series you wrote above. And then three. What do you notice about f of x and f prime? And do you recognize what the function f of x would really be? Pause the video and give this a shot. All right, let's take a look at the solution. First of all, write out an expression that includes the first five terms of the series. If you want to put f of x before that, I would caution you because you probably would need to put in approximately since we're only going to write five terms. So if n is equal to 0, we're going to start off x to the 0, which is 1, over 0 factorial, which is 1. 1 over 1 is 1. Move on to n equal 1. x to the first over 1 factorial is x. So far, so good. Let x be 2. x squared over 2 factorial would be x squared over 2. 3 down, 2 to go. Let x equal 3. Uh, let's let n equal 3, sorry. x to the third is x cubed, of course. 3 factorial is 6. And then the last one, n equal 4, x to the fourth, and then 4 factorial is 24. So there's your first five terms. Let's find f prime by differentiating the series above. So f prime is 0 plus 1 plus... 2 out in front cancels with the 2. We have x to the first. 3 out in front reduces with that 6, puts a 2 out in the bottom. We have x squared over 2. 4 out in front, uh, let's do the 4 out in front. 4 over 24 is 1 over 4, but that x is reduced to the third power, and of course over 4. And I tell you what I'm going to do here. In order to really address part three. What if I went up here, and I know that number one said we don't need to put any more than five terms, but if I did put the dot dot dots to indicate that this goes on forever, I could get by with putting an equals there. And notice I put an equals here, so I probably should do the same. 
And then the question is, what do you notice about f1 and f or f of x and f prime? Well, that's a good question. What do I know? Oh, what do I notice here? And I notice that I have possibly made a mistake. I notice that I don't know how to reduce. That's what I've noticed. Let's try this again, you guys. If the 4 is out in front, 4 divided by 24 is 1 over 6. Boy, would that change everything for this question. <laughs> so maybe some of you had caught that. Maybe I should have paused the video to work it out first. In any event, what do you notice about f and f prime? Hopefully, it's pretty clear that they're the same. And that's pretty powerful. Now, if I would continue with, say, the next term, you would probably uh, be able to surmise that it's going to be the same, x to the fourth over 24. Do you recognize what function does that? What function will allow you to take his derivative and it's the same? There's one that does it. Well, I lied. There's really two that do that. Only one would apply to this particular problem. And that function is, you guessed it, e to the x. Now, if you're scratching your head, what's the other one? I think it's zero, right? Would also fall under that category. But e to the x is the only one that's significant. And for whatever it's worth, this is the power series. This is the Maclaurin series. This is the Taylor series centered at zero. All of those are the same thing for the function e to the x. All right, let's now go ahead and look at our final example. Number four, we're given, hey, familiar friend here, right? We're given our e to the x uh, power series uh, in a slightly different, It's it, well, let me take that back. This is not the e to the x power series because it's missing the factorial, but it's like the e to the x's cousin from out of town without the n factorial. So what we're supposed to do here is to find the interval of convergence for each of the following. Now I'm going to go ahead and just to prove a point to you, I do want to find each of these individually and I will run through them very quickly using the ratio test. Uh, it shouldn't be uh, all that terribly difficult because it's not a very complicated expression in the nth term position here. So if I take the limit as n approaches infinity of f of x, I would have x to the n plus 1, of course, over n plus 1. Multiply that by the good friend reciprocal n over x to the n. And then I would end up doing some simplification next. And that would look something like x to the first times n over n plus 1. And I'm hoping at this point you can see that this is going to equal 1 as far as the limit is concerned. And our final result will just be the absolute value of x. All right, and we can just write that over here. Now to converge, we know the absolute value of x must be less than 1, which is another way of just stating negative 1 is less than x is less than 1 without regards to what's happening at the endpoints. Let's go ahead. We'll find the endpoint convergence as we move through each example. So we're going to check negative 1, and we're going to check positive 1. And I know that you might look at this and think, boy, this problem looks awfully familiar. Maybe we did something like this earlier. But if we check the 1, we end up with 1 to the n over n. And this is going to be divergent. It's the harmonic series. If we were to check negative 1, again, talked about this a little earlier. This is the alternating harmonic, and thus it converges. So what that means? When we're all said and done, the convergence for this particular problem is going to be the closed interval, negative 1, to the open 1. And I'm just going to write it in interval notation. OK. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at our next part here. So we're going to go ahead and look at f prime. Well, in order to look at f prime, we better calculate f prime. So the derivative of this power series would just simply be let n start at, and I know we talked a little bit about does the 
starting value of n changed. Let's not worry about that right now. It will not affect our analysis over the interval of convergence. So we bring the n in front. x now is raised to the n minus 1. And there was still already an n in the bottom. And that's just going to mean that those n's will reduce away. And you're left with the summation of x to the n minus 1. So looks like a great time to use the ratio test. So we let n approach infinity. We add 1 to the n, which gives you x to the n plus 1 minus 1, or x to the n, over x to the n minus 1. If you were to reduce this, it's a little tricky, but you're basically taking x to the first divided by x to the n minus 1, 1 minus the quantity n minus 1. Think about that. 1 minus the quantity n minus 1. Maybe we could write that out if that helps. That's going to be negative n, right? x to the negative n is the same as 1 over x. Let's get this straight now. Let's, uh, this is tricking me now. Negative, this is 1 minus n plus 1. So this is going to be 2 minus n. Let's, let's make sure that we have that right. And you know what? On further review, I'm going to back up. Let's take a look at this. If we were to add or change the n to n plus 1, I think I have the wrong exponent altogether. This should be x to the n, everybody. Apologies, right? We're, we're using the ratio test, so this n gets replaced with n plus 1. I've canceled n's instead of canceling 1's. n minus 1 is our exponent in the bottom. Now things to seem to be just a little bit better because now if I take n minus the quantity n minus 1, the answer is 1, and that's the power of x that's left in the absolute values. Hopefully that makes a little bit more sense to you. So this limit, of course, is absolute value of x. So in order to converge, boy, this is like deja vu all over again. Boy, this is like deja vu all over again. You have absolute value of x less than 1, which no mystery there. That gives us this interval. However, we need to check what is going on at the endpoints. So we'll check negative 1 we'll check positive 1. All right, you know me, I like to do it the same way all the time. Check the positive 1 first. We're going to do so, and you might want to take note of where we're going to go. We're going to go inside of this guy, right? We're only just going to use the, um, the function that we found. In this case, the f prime is what we're testing for. So if I check positive 1 first, I end up 1 to the n minus 1 power. That's what we're looking at. 1 raised to the n minus 1. Well, you know what? It really doesn't matter a whole lot what n is. If you're going to raise 1 to any power, you're going to get 1. This is just summing 1 over and over and over. That, my friends, is divergent. If we check its alternating counterpart, negative 1 to the n minus 1. In this case, you're going to get, well, if you start with n equal 1, you're going to get 1, then negative 1, 1, then negative 1, and 1, and negative 1. And thus, you've got two things that you just simply can't really figure out what's going to happen, right? The sum is either going to be 0 or it's going to be 1, depending on where you stop. And so therefore, we do not converge at either endpoint. So this would be a strictly open interval. And notice it is different, right, from its part A counterpart. And then lastly, let's look at the antiderivative of our good friend f of x. So I don't really know what to call this. So if you're, if you're acceptable, I'm going to refer to this maybe as capital F of x, just so I can give it a name. And that name would be, or that function would be, x to the n plus 1, right, over n plus 1, where there's already an n down below. And then I can put my summation in front of it as n goes from 1 to infinity. 
And so there is our integral. Oh, yep, with a plus C, you big old capital F of X, move over. I'm probably not going to do that. <laughs> uh, or I'm probably going to do that many times throughout the course of teaching this to my students. So, ratio test. Limit. As n approaches infinity of the absolute value, change out the n to n plus 1. But what are we going to do about the c? Okay, that's a good question. Let's talk about that right now because I want this c to be largely ignored. And here's why. The role of the c is just to take this function and shift it vertically. When you talk about the interval of convergence, that's only affecting how value or how reliable the resulting power series is between two different x values. Whether this thing is shifted up or below is not going to have any of bearing on that. So you're going to be able to forget that plus c whenever you're doing your analysis. So if we replace the n with n plus 1, I'll try to do it right here. We're going to do that both in the numerator and in the denominator. And then we're going to multiply by the reciprocal of the original expression. And now we reduce. We're getting close, folks. So x to the n plus 2 over x to the n plus 1 is just x. And we can do a little canceling, I suppose. The n plus 1s will reduce away, but not much more after that. And again, you find yourself in that same familiar situation, very similar to what we did in the in the f of x. This limit of n over n plus 2 is going to be 1, so you really don't even have to worry about him hanging around. He's not going to have any kind of effect on your overall interval of convergence. We know the answer to this limit is the absolute value of x times 1. To converge, that has to be less than 1, and guess what? We have the same answer, except we're not quite sure what's happening at the end point. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to check them. We're going to check negative 1, we're going to check positive 1, and see what's happening. So we check 1, check, check, check 1. We're going to get, going to go back up here. Again, the C doesn't make any difference. I, I will allow you to uh, temporarily ignore him. You're going to get 1 over n plus 1 all over n times n plus 1. Well, if you think about this, that numerator is just a 1 all the time. Dividing that by n quantity n plus 1 or n squared plus n, technically a limit comparison or direct comparison test is going to show you that this converges. I'm not so con so sure that you have to, to state which one. I'll say I could use the direct comparison test, but I'm not going to go through the hoops to show that that would be perfectly acceptable just to say converge. Now this guy here might be a little trickier because I think he's going to invoke the alternating series idea, right? When x is negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n times n plus 1. Well, in this particular case, you would probably be able to use the alternating series test, and I promise it will converge. Again, in a problem like this, it's likely that you would earn full credit by just saying converges. The only way that you would have to state the actual test is if my directions on my tests state so. So this is going to converge on the closed interval, negative 1 to positive 1, which obviously is yet a third. In fact, we had basically three of the four different kinds of interval convergences, right? The only one that we didn't see is open on the left and closed on the right. Again, I did do a lot more work than I needed to. The stuff I wrote in green and the stuff I wrote in purple, on a normal problem you wouldn't have had to have written because you knew the behavior had to go between negative 1 and 1 for convergence, and you could have just focused on checking the endpoints. But I wanted to prove that these three functions, no matter what they are, if they are 
related to the same original f of x, a derivative and an integral, they're always going to have the same interval of convergence except at the endpoints. This wraps up our topic 10, 13. Only two more topics to talk about until we close down unit 10. If you like what you're seeing, make sure you subscribe, and we'll see you next time.